Hi everybody and welcome back to the Trek Culture Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Sean Ferrick. I'm Paul Sutherland. And we are very lucky to be joined by the fantastic Trek Yards this week. Guys, how are you getting on? Welcome. How are you going? We are doing very well. At least I'm doing very well. I can't speak for the commander there, but uh, doing very well. Too, but yeah. <laughs> so, well, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us on. Are you guys oh, to be invited. Are you guys coping with uh, no new Star Trek for the foreseeable future? Oh, it's been a nice break. Twenty-three solid weeks of content and lives, and we were we were busting busting something pretty hard. I'll, I'll that, be honest. So. I, I'm thrilled. Because I was editing five, seven videos a week. Yeah. So I'm thrilled. It's That's nice not the not answer <laughs> I was expecting, but good. <laughs> Look, it was great. We'll wait for the next batch. It's good. It's all good. <laughs> we'll live our lives in between then. <laughs> I love it. It's like, you know, kind of, you know, you, you know, do you enjoy Star Trek? Yeah, sometimes. Oh, but listen, there's lives to be led. Um, <laughs> but no, that's, uh, that's what I mean. Like, let's kind of get straight into it because, like, obviously Sam so yourself and myself we will have obviously just watched Lower Decks which has only just released in uh, on Amazon in the UK and, and Ireland we would of course have not seen this before so how but do you I feel was, having freshly watched this but I was, I'm thrilled because I have a time machine luckily so I was able to go back and review them with Stuart in the past oh that's time brilliant machine. that's handy that's I mean handy. we have TARDIS yeah. in the UK you know at least in the British part of the UK so you know it's, it's great <laughs> no it's great. great great show well done make season 2 hurry up Mike <laughs> Mike, we know you're watching. Um, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to jump in. I, I loved this. I thought it was brilliant. And I loved, not to put make this too obvious or anything, I really loved the ships in it way more than I was expecting to. They're better than Picard ships, i got to say. Not, not the biggest fan of those, unfortunately. And we didn't get many beauty passes in Discovery. So, seeing the Parliament class, seeing the, the Titan is finally canonized now... Uh, the Luna class was great to see. So yes, fantastic ships. A lot of California classes, though, more than I expected. Yeah, well, you 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 mentioned California class last, and you add the though. So am I to assume that you're not a huge fan of the California class? When I first saw it, I was kind of shocked. But I did, I, you can ask Samuel. The, we, I did a first reaction to it, and the more I looked at it, the more I liked it, and it grew on me. I'm actually quite a fan of the ship. Um, it, it wouldn't be something I would design or think of necessarily but i think it works for what it is it kind of reminded me of something i would have designed in like the sixth grade when i'm like talking to my nerdy friends about star trek you know like mm -hmm. taking bits of the enterprise d and like cobbling together my own fictional ship but i think that's a lot mm -hmm. of the show to, to be honest like isn't that the a lot of the show kind of feels like playing star trek or imagining what it would be like in your own like child version not to like as, like i'm not casting aspersions on it saying it's childish or anything i love it but it's you know like it's a light-hearted you know colorful yeah. version of the of the of the franchise yeah yeah it's quite fun and i could i like, draw parallels to the mandalorian like the mandalorian the way that they play in that world mm -hmm. is very much how i would play with my action figures so that's why i really enjoyed it so i think the same thing can be said about lower decks so well, yeah not to like totally overwrite the conversation about the ships themselves, but I think the show um, reminds me a lot of The Mandalorian too because of how like concise the episodes are. You know, they mostly choose to tell one story and do that and then move on next week. I mean, we're talking about episodic television, which is like a novelty now, but mm -hmm. it's just like so clean and uh, easily di digestible, I think, both The Mandalorian and, and Star Trek Lower Decks. Yeah, absolutely. But I'll take us back to the ships, though, if, if I can. What's interesting, I think, about the Lower Deck ships is that we didn't get many, and they're not exactly beautiful or anything, but it, the whole show takes a TNG approach, just kind of modernised and with the self-knowledge of the universe it's in. TNG only had TOS, and they actively try to avoid parts of it. This is the first show that takes the same TNG approach, but really embraces it. And so we get the one hero ship, and then most of the other Federation ships are all kit bashes of that. And it comes across that way, that means it feels faithful to TNG. And the fact that we see four Californias or whatever, because they've only got one miniature, yeah, that's... But it kind of has that vibe. But you do get those great ships of the week, which are really interestingly designed, but also barely used and barely seen, but they're kind of like, oh, that's a nice design, as TNG had when they had the money to build something fresh. So it kind of feels TNG, even though it's modern. Right, and uh, I mean, like, the uh, par Parliament class, the Vancouver, just had the same interior as the California mm. classes, which... 
was either a nod or you know it's a, but, but listen now it's been going back because the Enterprise A had the same corridors as the Enterprise D and you know if a Constitution <laughs> class and a Galaxy class can have the same one internal chrome, workings one had a lot more chrome it felt one did, different uh, that you're absolutely right one did have a lot more chrome um, I, I am not a chrome denier here and I apologise to all chrome not enthusiasts side, not against Cylons then uh, good uh, oh no oh god no. although I do prefer the skin jobs I must say oh Oh, 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 oh dear oh, oh, <laughs> right man. moving swiftly along <laughs> yeah this is a unique uh, podcast for us we've talked about the Mandalorian and Battlestar Galactica so the, in the Orville what's your favourite ship in the Orville <laughs> <laughs> that being said we have Fleet Yard which is our spin off series all sci-fi ships like so. Babylon 5 yeah. uh, it's very dangerous because actually that's one thing now obviously Sam I asked you about this before you started recording but I just want to say it again I'm loving the wall behind you uh, Stuart I'm loving the wall behind you as well don't worry that I love you both equally but it's Thank absolutely you. fantastic uh, tell us a, just a little bit about where this has come from the fans and my PC all originally rendered all hand done all hand sized all hand everything and then put together a beautiful little collage but every single one is sponsored by a fan uh, so you know a bit, a bit of pride in every way there but it kind of gets me, lost as a picture, but it's yet when you see it, it's like, oh yeah, you kind of, you're always looking for stuff. Everybody asks him about his wallpaper. <laughs> Wait, can um, I buy that? It's like, oh, you can't. No, yeah, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> mine, mine is just, I got a lot of stuff and just, you know, just how, yeah. It's just always been like that. So there you go. I really uh, like, I'm, I'm also loving, sorry, I'm loving the, uh, the Elsars just above, just above your head there. Um, that is well proportioned. Paul, why don't we do something like that? We've really missed a bit of a trick here, haven't we? I mean, you can kind of see some models behind me and my little cheeky Enterprise A there. Yeah, I thought you were uh, doing it for us. <laughs> so let's talk about Lower Decks. Um, it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say, right, I'm, I can't wait until we get the inevitable models um, of all the ships. What I love about the California class is it looks like they scoured the galaxy for leftover... Uh, galaxy class saucer sections and just kind of slapped some engines onto them and I really like that kind of uh, you said it right the kit bash design I think that looks great because as you said I think of the Wolf 359 fleet I mean that really was they threw a saucer section at the wall and threw other bits and whatever stuck there you go that's going to be destroyed by the Borg mm -hmm. well, one of the unique things about the California class when we spoke with Mike McMahon is it, it, when you look at the saucer it's really not galaxy class at all um, and the nacelles are quite different. There was, there's definitely some aspects of the ship that we haven't seen come into play yet, which he kind of teased we would by the end of the season, and we mm. didn't really, and mm -hmm. I was kind of disappointed. But he might have been talking about season two because they were kind of working on that at the time. So, um, But yeah, I, I, it does look very kit-bashy, but it does work. It feels like one of the uh, FASA ships, actually, the old FASA um, tabletop combat simulator. They had some really f interesting designs, movie era like but they were very kit-bashy. Um, it's not for everybody. Some of them work, some of them don't. So, yeah. And the, uh, the California one's a bit weird, because it does, you know, their team really, honestly, if we're honest, they had to make a ship, their design ship intentionally, that was kind of ugly, because it's in the bottom rank of Starship. Now, Starship, yeah. not like freight and stuff, of that line. So how do you make your hero that looks not good? that yet looks like of the era, and yet... I mean, it's a hell of an ambitious, weird thing. So in terms of all of that, that's why the first reaction I thought, as, as we all were there, was like, ah. But when you realise every single piece is intentional, and, there's a, mm. and it all connects, it's like, yes, okay, and as those things come out more and more, you know, that's where the genius comes in. How do you design that? I wouldn't want to design that. But yeah. somehow, yeah, it's good. It's not the best thing they could have made, but that's with everything, you know? You know, like, Rutherford uh, mentions that the Cerritos is old... And, you know, they kind of avoided the, you know, like, giving her, like, battle damage or, you know, weathering or, you know, like, she still looks, like, pretty consistent with the way ships look in TNG. But they do, like, at least mention that she's kind of falling apart. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it even goes down to the, the registry, which is one of the first things everybody noticed. Um, we asked him, asked Mike about that, and he said he wanted it to stand out and be different, so it's kind of like a tramp stamp. <laughs> it's not. It's not loud and proud on the front. The ship's going to be towing other ships. It's kind of. It's you know. It's one of the least important ships, and I thought that was a very, very interesting way of, because we. That was the biggest. Thi one of the biggest things that we were talking about till we got a chance to speak with him was, what's with the registry? Every Federation okay. ship pretty much has a proud registry on the front. Okay. This one doesn't. So, that was an interesting little story. Well, he That's also. Amazing. 
told you guys first, I think, on your on, on Trek Yards mentioned uh, the color coding of the ships, right? Like, I think that's the first time that that got... I think people could guess it, but yeah, I think probably. Yeah. Probably for, for, first official, yeah. I mean, for those who don't know, you guys want to tell people what the color-coded uh, California-class starships means? Mm. I mean, because I feel like people probably didn't even really notice that they have different stripes unless you were really looking. Well, it is weird because no other ships do. It's kind of a, an odd thing. Yeah. It's like with the um, 30, 32nd century discovery. It's like, what's an operations dot? What's a command dot? What does a mm. command dot do? You know what I mean? So it's kind of redundant in and of itself. But yeah, you've got the red command, you've got the blue science, you've got the engineering. Luckily, we didn't see the blue one that much. It doesn't look as nice. Right, the yeah, red was the only blue one, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, I always felt like the w once we saw the Parliament class, it was a bit like so. W once you had taken the the ugly design of the California class, I say that with love. It's like they had refined it into the Parliament class. It's like this was maybe like a step beyond, say, refit Constitution to original Constitution. Maybe it was like the next step along the line. Yeah. They'd missed maybe, or they'd done something in the middle because the Parliament class looks gorgeous. Well, that's what I think probably happened was they designed a bunch of ships. Parliament was one of them. And Mike McMahon's like, no, that's too nice looking. Hold on to it. But we don't want our hero ship to look like that. Might have been kind of the thing that, the process that happened. And also, we did get hundreds of comments saying, oh, my God, yeah. that should have been the, the hero ship of low decks. What were they doing? Hmm. Yep. Like Absolutely. instant reaction. But there's a reason for it, because that's not, no offense, that Parliament class isn't memorable. It looks super normal. It's just an updated Miranda. Sweetos is memorable. True. You know it from every angle, better and worse. No, from every angle. That's totally fair. Yep, you're dead right. And it does, it stands out in the... Because I think, well, you said it, like, when we all saw that first picture, it was like, oh, God. And yet, once I saw it moving, like, as an actual footage of it, I went, oh, God, oh, this is actually great. Well, they actually treated it like a hero ship from any other Trek shows before Discovery in 09. Classic flybys, classic beauties, classic yeah. establishings, even at warp with the classic warp. You know, everything you'd expect. And so by seeing it in the normal ways, you grow to appreciate like every other ship, which other shows don't necessarily do, but they did. And it's like, oh my God, where's this been for the last 15 years? Yes. Beauty shots, <laughs> flybys, please. Yes, yes, please. I mean, just please. Sorry. I mean, so um, wait, well, so like, just following up on the beauty shot thing, uh, you know, so like what we're referring to obviously is the fact that Discovery Season 3 especially uh, gave us a ton of new 32nd century Federation starships and then mm -hmm. barely showed, you know, like barely gave the audience a, an opportunity to really get a good handle on what they look like. You know, we they, they, they make a big point to introduce Voyager J and then... She's like in the background for you know most of the rest of the episodes she appears in. Uh, yeah. Is that like a like a hangup for you guys? Like I, it was for us. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. Uh, we try to get the best shots from the, the episodes, and we enhance them, and we zoom in on them, and you know it's Samuel doing all his magic uh. over there, and we talk about them. So if you want to get a closer look at those ships, go subscribe to Trek Yards on YouTube. Just saying. I will throw but my yeah. support behind that. Please do. <laughs> Well, it's, but the journey about the Discovery sort of style of CG in the three seasons is quite a weird one. Season one started with ins insanely contrasty, dark shots that you might have got lots of close-ups, but you couldn't see anything pretty much. And so at university, kind of like, it might look modern, but it doesn't look good by any means. The end of the season, the few shots they had, they really toned that down as the production team were changing and you know, just different people were giving different orders. Season two, they had some genuinely nice beauties. They genuinely did, and some because they learned that Discovery is way too long, so let's do a more uh, zoomed-in focal length that hides things. You know, classic tricks you learn did better. Season three, they did better, and then at the same time, like you said, just didn't show stuff. But as an artist myself, CG artist, like, pr putting all your fleet of ships in a black bubble with only blue light from one direction, that's not an easy sell. And clearly, they weren't able to achieve good-looking ships from the abstract sense of good-looking. And you can tell those ships weren't the focus of any episode. You know, there wasn't any call in any of the scripts for a close-up, so they didn't detail them as you would a hero sh ship. And unfortunately, ships in Voyager and Enterprise from the 90s and 2000s are actually nicer 3D models because they would actually get more screen time, or at least closer up. So they would, a lot of the time, Pixamundo, which is the main VFX house, they have so many different shows and, TV and movies. So they can only do what needs to be done, and if they don't need to be done, then they don't get done. That's why a lot of the Discovery Season 2 models are lackluster, and Season 1 
Ah, uh, you know, mud ship, awful. But, yeah, uh, you know, we, we hope with, like, the Picard finale they would improve them for the Blu-ray. No, but at least Star Trek Online improved them, so go look at the Inquisitor for Star Trek Online. It's beautiful! It fixes everything about the ship. Wait, you were hoping that they would add more detail to the Inquiry class ships well, at I the mean, end of uh, Picard? It's an embarrassing there. scene. Everyone knows it's an embarrassing scene. If you're cloning the ship anyway, instance it, and you just change one ship and then you instance it again and you re-render it. You know, they had four or five months of Blu-ray. You know, I would be embarrassed as an artist to get that out. They should be too. Well, Stuart, they you could mentioned... Fixed in post. Sorry, Stuart, you mentioned that uh, you weren't super into the uh, Picard ships. Uh, I mean, they did at least give us a plenty of, uh, you know, good looks at, like, the La Serena and the uh, Romulan ships, um, which is kind of an interesting... Uh, you know, it's interesting that the two uh, Discovery and Picard had such different approaches to their uh, establishing shots. But uh, I, I personally thought that La Serena was kind of like an interesting departure. Uh, how'd you guys feel about that ship? I have a three D uh-huh. printer right okay. here, but it looks very Batman like to me. <laughs> it um, actually does. It does. It looks like a yeah. cool Batwing. So clearly, yeah. the red is like a like a big part of the appeal of that ship. Oh, well, for some, I guess. Not for me personally, mm-hmm. but the biggest issue I had with Picard ships, like, yeah, I liked the antique uh, Romulan Bird of Prey. That was beautiful. Awesome. Yes, it was, um, yeah. Tr- you know, doubling down, putting Discovery shuttles in that time period was a big no-no for me. That mm-hmm. update mm-hmm. the shuttles. me now as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We need the sad Ooh. violin music there. <laughs> yeah. We a do. little bit, Wha- like... Walking into Starfleet headquarters, looking up, seeing the hologram of the Galaxy class, then it instantly turns to the Disco Enterprise. Don't get me wrong. I like the Disco Enterprise, but it's not my canon Enterprise. It's not Prime Timeline. So they immediately put Picard, in my ver- in my opinion, in the Disco Verse, as I call it, um, and it's not the Prime Timeline. Things That's like true. that are very disappointing to me. Well, well um, now I now I have to ask: Do you guys both, in your head canon, believe that Discovery is set in an, an alternate, alternate timeline, an altered timeline? I do. I have to in, 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 order, in order to enjoy the show. Because um, it's clearly t- takes too many steps away from visual canon for me. So, and I'm a you know canon purist in the sense that if they say it's canon, it's canon. If they didn't yes. say it was canon, we couldn't make our great analysis videos. Because if the discovery is in a separate universe, we can't compare the tech to anything. Therefore, there's nothing to talk about. But when they say it's canon, we can say to them, "Well, you doubled the size of the Enterprise three years ago. It was this size. Then you doubled it for four years. Then you went back to being the same size." So why would why did you refit it three times in four years for no reason? Why was the you know so as soon as they so the fact they says canon makes us have the ability to shoot them in the face and in essence with the canon they do wrong, which is fun, <laughs> but it's not great. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, thankfully Picard avoided any like massive starships that you know seemed outsized. But obviously we just got mm-hmm. off of season three of Discovery where you know the finale had the insane. Um, hollow space that's supposed to be the uh, what uh, turbo lift you know hub or I, I, don't, I don't know what it is but uh, no one does they don't <laughs> know what it is I, I don't think they're living that one down anytime soon I mean I caught a, a video of yours where you guys had uh, calculated that that Resigned. simply would not fit inside Discovery no uh, that's that's a big sticky point for me. And people say, well, you forget, you know, episode 16 of season 2 of Enterprise, Future Tense, where they had the 31st century technology. And it's like, no, we didn't. Watch season 1 and 2 of Discovery that happens pre-TOS. The turbo lifts, the, those big caverns are there. Yeah. They're even in the Enterprise. They're in P- Pike's Enterprise, hence Kirk's Enterprise. No, that's just wrong. I'm sorry. And we could have forgiven that a little bit for season 3, because season 3 was so much better. But then... Like I said, they quadrupled down on the stupid in the very last episode by making a super long, unnecessary fight scene, which could have been cut down and or not included, and just showed off this cavernous space. So yeah, we, we were saying in our review of that that the episode was like a solid great and then just went like this and then flatlined for a good like nine minutes. And oh, the end was great. It's yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen an episode that was that dramatic and just it felt like a different person wrote that segment and said, right, now you've got to go make it. And since it's all green screen based stuff, they could just have reshot it anyway. It felt so disconnected from the rest of it of quality versus childish JJ. Weird. I think I've, well, I, I don't know if I love the childish JJ thing, but it's a. Well, a turbo lift sequence in your ship that doesn't fit in a fight, you know, that, I mean, that, the idea of that scene is childish. Well, I think that, I think the interesting thing about, like, if, if you're going to compare it to the Abrams movies, when you do get shots of the, 
like expansive interior of the Enterprise, it generally conforms to what you would imagine like the shape of the ship would be. And with like that discovery sequence, y- you could not place it. And like, yeah, you know, you saw like schematics of the ship that showed like a, an open area, but given the shape of the ship, like that open area could simply not be that large. You know, even if they're like going back and forth in the turbo lifts across that space repeatedly, it still just didn't quite like make a lot of sense. But like, you know, I, and I've said this before, like I think with Discovery, you kind of like have to turn off part of your brain to enjoy the show, and like that's like at least for me, like you know, like I'm like big into like how starships work and like you know the quirks and the production design, but you know, like watching that, you know, like. You, I, I had obviously like the same hang up you guys did, but like I had to just like let that not affect my enjoyment of the finale. Though I didn't really enjoy the finale anyway. But is that like something that you guys are able to do with Discovery? Is detach well, from that? In, in that case, just breathe and say the Discovery fit is much nice than Discovery. Discovery fit is much nice than Discovery. Well, yeah, you know what, it grew yeah. on me. Just savor that. Yeah, it grew on me. I think when I initially saw it, uh, I was still coming to terms with programmable matter, um, but I. I like it now. At the start, I was a bit like, ah, I see. And the wonderful confrimplimplimp will go in here and that will make this happen. <laughs> I'm talking about a show that uses dilithium as an engine source and I, I laugh at myself sometimes, but the detachable nacelles, I don't know if I'm still, I still don't know if I'm sold on them, uh, even though they look great. And I, I do like the look of them and I like them on Voyager J. Um, I just still don't really get why. Well, can I make a quick analogy to uh, the cat? And in fact, the dog from Picard. They, yeah, they yeah. sell them as a point of, of, oh, look! But they're not played in any specific way beyond, okay, there they are moving on. And the cat was done perfectly. It wasn't a big deal, but it was just there. So you, they make a deal out of those, those engines being touchable. means nothing in the grand scheme. And they even retach for warp. And sometimes yeah. spore drive. Sometimes not spore drive. Inconsistent. But they don't mean oh, much. I did, yeah, you're right. Actually. I mean, and there yeah. was so obviously similar. also a plot point in the finale about the engines, so they could have like yeah. tied that into it some way, but they did not. So that's okay. It's a gimmick that... I mean, it, I don't know if you noticed, but in the, in the bridge, they have this whole scene of them being a move matter. Never used again on the bridge. Never once again. Everyone just uses the standard controls, because they realize it's expensive and doesn't add anything. Exactly, and I think does <laughs> Why would you do says at one point, you know, when they do the kind of the reset of the computer core, uh, there's sort of yeah. a throwaway line about, oh well, and that's the end of the programmable matter here and there, uh, not of not on the exterior of the ship, of course, because the nacelles are still detached. But yeah. there's there's a, a comment that says, yeah, there won't be any of those joysticks. So like, All right, and as you said, Sam's like, cost too much, did it? All right, that's cool, that's grand. So no, season three, I think, raised the bar in quality for the story we got in Discovery I I would agree I think Paul I know you feel this way as well season 2 of Discovery is probably still my favourite in a large part because of this, the whole story with Pike and the Enterprise I was very pleasantly surprised at how much I really liked Anson Mount uh, really liked Ethan Peck as Spock mm-hmm. our third Spock in however long um, but I know my best my favourite Star Trek of the year was Lower Decks Oh yeah, hands yeah. down. Yeah. No competition. Uh, no, no, no Picard championers out there. I mean, I argued that you know I argued <laughs> for Picard in you know uh, the last podcast we did, but I I wasn't saying that that was the best of the year. I you know I think that Lower Decks is like head and shoulders above a lot of Star Trek that's come out in the last couple what decades. Well, it's the best since mm-hmm. since Enterprise, and for my father, it's the best since Voyager, which yeah, goes I would back agree a long with that. way. Yeah, uh, but briefly on Picard though, if you if you sim- if you simplify what Picard is, it's an incredibly simple story that was dragged over a lot of episodes. That if you watch it week to week, you, there's so many threads, and we looked at them, me and Stuart, and we were excited by the possibility. Ninety five percent of them went nowhere because they weren't important. Slash, the writers just threw in things, and in the end, it finishes almost every plot line, which leaves almost nothing left. Clearly feels rushed and clearly feels they swapped because they did. They made two episodes out of nowhere and removed two episodes out of nowhere, so you can't reform a season properly. And if you binge it, you don't think about it, so you just go through because it's such a simple, not you know, very limited story. So it's a show that had so much promise but should have been did made differently. But a better is binge show. So how everyone else is going to watch from now on? That's the thing. Do you do you make it for the first audience or everyone else forever? You know that's tricky. No, I mean, I assume that um, you could enjoy binging it 
in like a more episodic or like a little bit you know tighter way but uh, you know beyond that I, I i i thought that it was stronger than discovery season three but i i, I think i'm probably alone here with that too but yeah <laughs> probably yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Going back to the detached cells for just a second, um, yeah, yeah. that's a great way of showing advanced tech. The problem that Discovery ran into is they based their tech when they started the show on advancements from our future, not from Star Trek's future, because um, they already had holograms. They already had all this fancy stuff, which you move to the future. How do you improve that? The nacelles aren't, aren't attached. That's the way we, we're going to do that. So that's the problem that they ran into with Discovery. And one of the mistakes I think they made is trying to retcon the tech. TOS has always been a period piece. It has been in, you know, in, in Relics and TNG and in DS9 when they showed it. And in Amir Darkly and Enterprise. It's always been a period piece. They went to great effort to make it look like it should. And with new lighting techniques, things like that, you can really make the TOS look, look good. Despite everybody's arguments. They went into this with the Brian Fuller directive of can't have cylindrical nacelles, can't have this, can't have that, and looking totally different than TOS and retconning it so that it's a f it's technolo technology based on our future, not what we see in Star Trek. And I think that's why the detachable nacelles are a thing, because how else are we going to make things look advanced in the future? They're yeah. not connected, you know? And just to give some direct examples, you know, it, when you watch the first episode of the season three, if you look at the view screen, they must have rushed it. They use the exact same graphic for all the L cars on the, on the view screen as in Discovery Season 2. So why are they using a 900-year-old computer interface? Then you jump to Picard. Picard now feels not advanced at all because they have that tech in Discovery. So Picard yeah. now feels rudimentary. And then you think about the dots. The dots would be really impressive in Discovery Season 3, these little repair robots. But because Discovery invented them for Season 2, they feel completely <coughs> underwhelming. And the Enterprise and who cares? had them all along, apparently. Yeah. Like, well, according yeah. to the short trek Ephraim and Dot, uh, there <laughs> were DOTs nope. on the Enterprise the entire time. So, well, well, according to window. that short <laughs> trek, the Enterprise A self destructed. Yeah, there's also a window in Sick Bay, and the registry is on the side of the hall for some reason. Like, <laughs> it's the oh, least kind of thing possible that will think. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, okay, so we're I think we're all like really anticipating uh, Star Trek Strange New Worlds uh, in part because of these Paramount Plus ads that have been <laughs> showing up every couple of days. Um, mm. Are you guys are hoping that they retain the visual style that they established in Discovery Season 2? Are you looking forward to like maybe like a re-refit Enterprise or... or is that well, just like an exhausting Enterprise. premise, the idea so of seeing want. another Enterprise? Yeah, what we want, we won't get, which is more TOS looking. They've already built the sets. They've already set their look. They're going to yeah. continue with that, unfortunately. Um, yes and but, no. I'll let you finish. Yeah, but they have the, they have the opportunity to kind of um, fix things along the way. Um, but I'll let Samuel take over from here because I think I know what he's going to say. Well, and just keep in mind, they finished season two of Discovery, but since then we've had all of season three being filmed, released, mm -hmm. season four being filmed, the Stranger Worlds isn't filming yet, or at least is just about to film. Or So that means they've had over a year of those sets. The Enterprise Bridge was packed away or destroyed. It wasn't kept up in soundstage for a, a year and a half. That's not, that space is more important for all of Discovery sets. So that stuff's flat packed, they can rebuild it and repaint it. They're gonna do it anyway. And given it was only on a two episode budget, they have a season budget now. They're going to do new corridors because they're discovery corridors and new everything else. So I guarantee they'll do a pretty decent amount of rejig, especially with the ships, because they can sell models. You know what I mean? You guarantee and it or you hope for it? It makes sense because they also want to They also want to make it look better than Discovery because that's kind of their brand new show. If it looked the same, it wouldn't be a selling point. Whereas they could say, hey, we're the Enterprise refit, 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 pre Connie, as in pre Enterprise. So I think it'll be different as a way of selling it different. But it all depends on the showrunner. Because look at the showrunners we got. We got the first couple had their own ideas. We got My Own Man made Trek. Beautiful. And we had Michelle Paradise from Discovery Season 3 kept the formula but gave her own real spin of story and characters over all else. And that benefited the Trek vibe a lot. So if the showrunner really cares, it will. But remember, the only reason the Enterprise bridge is like 25% bigger, 30% bigger, is because Kurtzman said, oh, I want to see a corridor, a corridor around the edge. It's like, but that won't fit in the ship. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. And now there's a corridor. That, that's it. That's the only. It was built to scale, and he, he added it because he's a bit of an idiot. With that comes that stuff. So, I think I think they know, 
I think they'll make it better. You know, it was such a good Fingers bridge. Crossed. Just change it 30%, 40%, 20, you know, I was trying to go down 25%, 10%, you know. Yeah. Actually, I think that this is a good opportunity to talk about news. Sean, what do you think? I think it's a pretty good time. Yep. For over two centuries, you're listening to the Federation News Network. We've one bit of news that dropped and then immediately seemed to undrop. Uh, Paul, you want to take this one? Yes. Um, it was reported last week that Lycia Naff, who played Sonia Gomez in uh, mm-hmm. Q Who and I think the mm-hmm. Samaritan Snare in TNG Season 2, uh, she did a podcast back in October uh, where she said that she was going to be appearing in Lower Decks as Sonia Gomez. However, all the sites that were reporting that have now removed that reporting. Yeah, I saw so that. Just so we don't get pulled down, we are reporting on the fact that it was reported. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are not and saying it, that this is actually happening or, you know. We, and we're not directing people toward the weekly Trek pod where you can listen to her interview of her talking about it. We're certainly not saying that. If it still exists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think? So this would be a legacy character, um, allegedly, coming back to Another Star Trek. One. How do you feel about this kind of supporting characters coming back as opposed to you know I think Jonathan Frakes is contractually obligated to appear once a season in every single show (laughs) you know how do you feel about having other people coming back I think it's great especially like a character that was in two episodes um be cool to see Leffler come back she was in I was just two two or three episodes as well um but yeah the, the biggest thing we've been talking about that I would really like to see is Ensign Kim come back whether he's still mm. an ensign or not, it would be the, the joke, right? Um, but yeah, please bring those people back. We've, we've come up with so many great s- story ideas of people that could come back um, that we've mentioned during our reviews and stuff that it's definitely a possibility. And to hear that rumor was made me kind of smile. It was like, yeah, that's great. It's a character some people will remember, some won't, but it's, it's, it's that, that canon that really you know adds to the mythos of everything. And we had just watched it in our TNG review, and, and yeah. I think we both said, why is this woman not in more? I know she was meant to be and then wasn't. Right. Such an obvious choice for that sort of weirdly memorable, obviously, you know, looks and sounds different, so it won't be quite the same performance because part of the performance of being cute and young and naive, etc. Mm. But yeah, brilliant. I mean, why why wouldn't you bring legacies back? Because Mike Man's a very, very clever man. It's like, wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't be surprised if we see the Traveller and really, you know, odd, what? Really? Yeah, like, actually makes sense. It was like, oh, spoiler for the lot. Uh, the villains of the end of Lower Decks is an inspired choice. Who the hell would have thought of that? Inspired beyond words. So, I, yeah, brilliant. I howled, laugh. I have to say, like, full on, you know, I LOL'd out loud. I did. Mm-hmm. You know, especially when they were saying, oh no, another Enterprise. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, it was perfect. I have to say, it was perfectly written. Mike McMahon, out of everyone who seems to be working at CBS at the moment, gets Trek. And he gets Trekkies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, see, like when I saw that Sonia Gomez might or allegedly will appear, she on may Lodex, be wrong, but she's it, already been fired, <laughs> right? Or she could have said something that yeah. got misconstrued. I don't know. I haven't listened to the podcast, but uh, I don't really like podcasts. I don't, you know. Um, I Why just let this guy on these things. I didn't know that I like needed that. Like, I never like liked Sonia Gomez. Like, I was thought she was kind of like a cheesy addition to TNG. Sorry. Um, but like, as soon as I read that, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like, I need Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks. She's like the prototypical Lower Decker. Well, it's like Barkley. If he's not in it, it'll be astounding. It's such a perfect character to bring in that show. Yeah. Yeah, actually, Joe, I hadn't thought of him, and now that you say it, it would be perfect. I would love to see a Lieutenant Junior Grade Kim, who finally <laughs> got a promotion after all these years. But he got a, he didn't make captain, but he got a promotion. And the Lower Decks crew get him. De- demoted that'd be hilarious <laughs> something they well, did <laughs> now see what no what you do is have him be like one step towards admiral and then mariner meets him and gets him and he has to like oh. go undercover as an ensign and everyone's like what are you the delta quadrant it's like that's a different kim <laughs> a little old for an ensign aren't you <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so uh you know uh, other news that we were briefly talking about before was the fact that cbs all access is being rebranded finally as paramount plus which begins on march 4th right mm. march, march 4th, my, uh, march 4th yeah um 
we have been getting obviously those little kind of teasers that have been dropping on Twitter. Now I've been loving them because they're technically, oh, this is going to sound so silly, but they're advertising Strange New Worlds. This is like the first kind of trailer. And I'm really stretching the definition of trailer here. The fact that Pike and Spock were in these scenes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. Did you see, I presume you caught the one, um, I think it came out the, was it yesterday, or the day before yesterday, where Spock is about to amputate the arms of a puppet. I and didn't see a, that one. Oh, it's very <laughs> you didn't. Good. You didn't see that. Yeah, you gotta you gotta Not check yet. that out. Yeah. It's it makes some choices. Um, I, I I wondered, you know, like uh, rather than like enjoying them for like stupid spots that they are, I'm like, ooh, I wonder if this is what they're gonna be wearing in Strange New Worlds. Like, oh, is that the way Spock's hair is gonna look in Strange <laughs> New Worlds? Um, yeah. But I feel like these like thirty second spots with like tiny little slivers of Pike and Spock are like feeding the fandom right now. Well, it's doubly interesting because Patrick Stewart was the voiceover for at least one yeah. of them, I believe, both yep. of them. Yeah. And again, both in, in full costume show the least they're super engaged. No, it, I mean, that's a real symbol. I think even the, the longer one had Sneak Command Green as well, not actually in it, but a, like a clip from Discovery Season 3. Yeah. And that's like three full parts of their Trek universe being included in a very short set of trailers. I know obviously they've got five shows and probably getting close to a billion dollars per you know per cycle of these shows that's a lot of investment but that shows a lot of confidence and given yeah. that all the shows are theoretically getting better and better and better that's a good sign that's a good sign I think, it, I think it puts to rest some of the rumors channels oh, that saying right. that Strange New Worlds won't go into production or has been cancelled hmm? and you know, I was just yeah. wondering uh, did anyone catch how many times the show's been cancelled today I think it was five five times it was cancelled today I stopped counting it's just <laughs> oh my god wait breaking news Trek Culture Podcast been cancelled what oh, yeah right. oh, <laughs> Trek Culture was cancelled two years ago oh, man. oh my goodness oh yeah this Nobody isn't this isn't broadcasting this isn't connected to anything just thanks for joining us for the chats it's been great fun <laughs> oh. um, it is it's you know despite the schism along some of the lines of the fandom I think it's a good time to be a Trekkie at the moment You, we have content to love or hate but we have content well, the fact there's an upward Absolutely. Trajectory is important because you can start with rough, rougher content. Mm. But as long as you know, because the fact is, Brian Fuller had had bad ideas, you know, and they had to, had to, had to forcibly scrub that and move them. But once you commit to ten million dollars worth of sets and costumes, you you know what I mean. So they've been yeah. changing progressively. And how many showrunners have they gone through now? Not in a bad way, just they keep changing their vision. But they're gonna they're gonna really get there at one point. And it isn't the you know TNG got good in season three thing? That's, that's completely different. An analogy, but it ta it's a new company. It's a new thing. It's a new people doing it. it makes sense. It takes a few times. You know, Beyond was the best of the three Trek movies. That took them three to get. It just took an entire different team to make it. They got there. <laughs> uh, so there's actually other news, though. Like I can't believe how much news. Little tiny little tidbits. Um, but. Uh Kate Mulgrew did another podcast, and I, I'm not prepared at all, so I can't tell you which podcast, but she, again, seemingly indicated that Star Trek Prodigy is going forward with uh, a second season. Um, makes sense because it's animated. Uh, I think I believe Lower Decks got announced as a mm -hmm. two-season uh, pickup, but, uh, you know, that was something that I wasn't really expecting to hear so, so soon. And that was an online convention where you get, like, two minutes yeah. with the actor and mm -hmm. you get to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She just said it out of the blue. It was really random. I watched it. It was quite sweet, though. Makes sense. I mean, they, they, they need the animated shows. Yeah, they, they need do. them more than anything else right now. Because they, mm -hmm. if they don't gain content out, people aren't paying monthly. Right. And I'm That's excited true, actually, and yeah. confused and just hopeful for Prodigy. Like, so many thoughts are going through my head. And then they get announced that Janeway's in it. And it's like, okay, so the original idea that I kind of thought in my head is now a little bit changed. So I'm looking forward to seeing what that's all about. Because that's exciting. Right, for those who don't know, what is Prodigy, Sean? So Prodigy, it's, uh, it is very much aimed at the younger audience. Uh, the animation style is going to be like uh, Troll Hunters, uh, if anyone knows. It's uh, C like CGI as opposed to, say, the mm. traditional animation of Lower Decks. Um, Janeway will be acting as a sort of a guide and a mentor for um, a group of... Wayward teams, yeah, or something kind like of wayward teams. And also, they, Captain they, Jane, we're not Admiral. They called out Captain, so it's a weird hmm. point in the timeline. Oh hmm. yeah, that's actually that is interesting because, yeah, because you know she's Admiral Janeway in Star Trek really Nemesis. Really quickly, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so 
I don't know. Maybe they maybe they hadn't even landed Voyager by the time they were like, actually, uh, sorry, Captain, we need you. Um, <laughs> but um, so was... so obviously, there's no date yet on when it's releasing. I think I think it's 2021. So that would mm-hmm. be great It'd if it was. And obviously, it's yeah. it's yeah. obviously much easier to get it out quicker. Again, animation you uh, record. Um, so. I don't know. I, I look. I have no no idea what to expect. I'm really enjoying anything. Pretty much, Kate Mulgrew does. Kind of related, not related, but has anyone had a chance to read or listen to Una McCormick's the autobiography of uh, Janeway? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm I'm just coming up to the end of the audio book now. Kate Mulgrew is narrating it. It mm. is absolutely brilliant. I don't think we often do book recommendations on this pod, but I am <laughs> recommending this one right now. It's fantastic. It's awesome. It's fun. I was, I was just thinking, you know, if she's Captain Janeway, this obviously happened before, you know, when before she became a... They, they got back the first time, and then, you know, she did the pro- prodigy thing, then got became old Janeway, and went back in time and changed <laughs> things. The end game, future Janeway. Oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah oh, it's, plot twist. I like it. So there's an yeah. time timeline that gets undone. Mm. Oh, dear. That's a, <laughs> hey, that, that's a way of doing new canon. It's like, oh, it gets undone in five years. It's fine. Yes. The thing about Prodigy is that the kids' show Motica is a thing to worry about because there yes, are kids' shows and there are kids' shows. There's the Teletubby yeah. kids' show, if that translates to the American people, where yes. it's only aimed at children. Adults will not enjoy it beyond the, the visuals. But there's the Disney film, adult, uh, kids' film, more of the old you know, 90s ones, where there are layers. Kids mm-hmm. enjoy it because it's pure, ah, but you watch it as an adult and still enjoy it, and you can go back and watch it as an adult. So if they make it for kids, it will not stand the test of time make it good that happens to have a younger slant but even that four kids they're all ensigns they can't be younger than 18 and yeah. no that they'd be cadets so they have to be at least you know 20 21 so they're not actually young in the boimler is the same age and tendy's the same age so that's not considered a young program so that that you know it's not 15 year olds it's not 13 year olds it's 18 to 20 year olds and it's and you know what i mean so they've already it can't be that kids doesn't make sense it's- I, I, I probably I hope it's like Beast Wars honestly which is CG written for the older G1 crowd but also brought in the kids as well with deeply layered storytelling Beast Wars was fantastic so if I it's really like that Beast Wars. I, 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 did, I, did, I did too if it's like that yes that's what I want <laughs> my, my assumption has been that it would be like Clone Wars just to throw another one in there um, mm. which is mm. you know ostensibly yep. for kids but you know is clearly you know uh, aimed at like the dedicated Star Wars you know, fan yeah. base. Yeah. And if you watch all Mulgrew's appearances, she always says it's about inspiring young kids like I did in Voyager. So I think it's more the modicum of it makes younger people feel they can do something, they can really achieve. So it's more about the inspirational side, which, which means positive, a positive yeah. show, which is definitely what we want. So that, that, and definitely different to Lower Decks, which is about the screw ups. <laughs> so also good. That's true. Yeah, different. Yeah. Um, and then, Paul, you had one last piece of news as well um, from, from last week. Yeah, um, I'm just waiting for while, the sirens. While you are arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Must be breaking important news with the sirens. Wait, is Selena Gomez? It's exactly. Selena Gomez thing. She's being, you know, the CBS account. Did you say Selena Gomez? I did. What's her name? <laughs> Sonia Gomez. There, uh, I, nice. I would be delighted if Selena Gomez turns out <laughs> in Star Trek. Oh, I think she'd be brilliant. Hey, maybe it was a misunderstanding and so, uh, Selena Gomez <laughs> is what uh, Lysia and F is talking about. That's why this things were taken down. Um, yeah. Okay, well, now that the cops are gone, um, <laughs> yeah, I did um, Deadlines a virtual screening of that Hope Is You last week. Uh, it had a, a um, panel uh, with Kurtzman, uh, Michelle Paradise, and Sonequa Martin-Green, and it was a lot of uh, backslapping. Um, they did mention that the villain for season four is going to be some kind of science-y uh, obstacle over, you know, like a physical, you know, mustache twirler, though... You know, I, I, that was kind of treated as news, but I, I, I kind of been thinking that like that's actually the villain of both season two and three is like a yeah. technological scientific problem plus you know yeah. like a, a like a villain on the side. So I don't I don't see how that's going to be you know too different. Though if it's a purely scientific obstacle, you know that could obviously be you know more towards the kind of Star Trek that we all grew up with that we kind it's of like, Voyager Seven. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, and beyond that, he mentioned that um, you know, book and uh, and uh, Michael's relationship would uh, be tested. And I wish I cared. Yeah. 
<laughs> I like him. I do. <laughs> I, I do too. I just um, I, it's 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 funny. Like I'm like, well, you didn't mention anything about like if we're gonna see the Klingons in season four. Like for some reason, like that's the kind of stuff I care about with Discovery, and the interpersonal stories still have failed to capture me. I, I tend to agree. Um, I, I was knowing there's going to be problems between Stamets and Burnham, and now that Burnham's boyfriend does Stamets' job, it won't matter, and Stamets will be pushed off. The, like, there's a lot of drama there that can be created, but yeah, true. I don't yeah, know. yeah. Um, I I suppose for, for myself, I I agree, Paul. Like the season three, um, my feelings on the burn are well documented at this point. Um, the I don't remember what what what, what did you say about the burn. I don't really remember the burn either. It's been great. Burn um, yeah, exactly. I, I'm fine. See, I like the idea of um, if you take, for example, say the Romulan super. So going back a thousand years, the Romulan supernova. I would have loved to have seen the dash to evacuate Romulus. If that's maybe not that story, obviously going into season four, but something mm. potentially like that, where you have a deadline of say ten episodes, so they don't hopefully touch what they won't go with a Ooh, we don't know what it is no no we know what it's going to be we know we have a deadline and we have to act toward this for whatever reason it's going to be now knowing Star Trek Discovery it's going to be the galaxy's going to blow up you know but what can we do to stop the galaxy from blowing up in the next X amount of episodes and I would actually like to see that because then you could have the Klingons could come in Navarre could come in you might have to have people working together what would be what great? Do you think, guys? What would be great is an outside threat, like another galaxy, like the Andromeda galaxy, threatening the the, the Milky Way. So the galaxy as, as a whole has to come together to defeat a, a common foe. Um, and you know, c- considering they got the lithium back, maybe they're experimenting again with new drives. They find a drive that takes them to the Andromeda galaxy, makes them aware of our presence, and it, it, you could do something really interesting that way. Um, and we we've, we've done a live talking about um, our predictions for season four. Um, and there's some good ideas in that. So yeah, that's another uh, plug of- for Trek Yards on YouTube. Yes, I like it. We always have good discussions like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I actually think that you know, uh, given our like gripes about the burn and the ticking clocks on Discovery, is like a perfect time for us to talk about Cargo Bay 101. <laughs> So, Cargo Bay 101, as I'm sure you know, is this infinite space which anything can go into and then immediately be blasted out of. Now, if it gets blasted out of there, that's it. It's gone. It's removed from Star Trek. Now, I want to stress that we change the rules every week. So, basically, if you want it gone going forward, but you don't really want to take it away from the past, that's fine too. Nobody's going to police that hard. But, is there anything in all of Star Trek that you think should be depressurized and suffer a horrific, if quick, destruction. Yeah, we won't make you guys do it jointly, so uh, Stuart, you start and then... (laughs) I'll go make a cup of tea while he'll discuss his... It'll be quick. I can really think of two things. Can I do two things? Of course. It's it's a big cargo bay. Okay. Speaking of big cargo bays, hashtag Turbolift Caverns. Turbolift Planet. Go. Bye. Gone. Done. I don't know if anybody's ever said that before, but they have, yeah. So that's good. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we did they're, that already. They're, they're dead. Oh, that one came up rather quickly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, then it, that, okay. So yeah, how about uh, view screens on large starships mm. being windows? Because hmm. they never were until 2009. Now they're <sighs> everywhere. Small ships like the Raven, stuff like that. They're more like a runabout. That's fine. Uh, makes perfect sense. But uh, they've always been view screens, never windows until 2009. Now everybody has them, so they can go bye bye. Yeah, I, I think I could get behind that myself um, because I remember back in 1996 with First Contact and that was the first time I had seen a view screen was actually just a wall. Uh, they turn yep. on the view screen as they arrive at Sector 001 and yep. up until that point it's always been a star field or something. And So there's like two yeah. opposite ends of the spectrum there is, a, is the wall view screen that's just a wall, blank wall that you stare at all day unless there's something outside to look at. Or I'm there's a the or, on a fish, fish yeah. aquarium or something. Or there's the window where you can't not look out the damn thing. 
You can make it opaque so you can't see out of it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I stand by the window. I stand by the window, so I'm not putting it in there. But you guys, you do. I'm going to vote to put the window in Cargo Bay 101. <laughs> I I don't love it, and kind of maybe this is unfair to the window, but any graphic I've seen of the view screen on the window has just just looked kind of messy, um, and that's more on I suppose the design. You know, say the Kelvin Universe view screen didn't love it uh, a lot of the disco stuff didn't love it except season 2 episode 1 brother I did love seeing Pike's kind of history with the Enterprise yeah. sitting out beyond I have to say yeah. so can I keep that one but chuck the rest of the windows in cool okay so Sam you're going to be the deciding vote here oh god no it's already been gone I mean are you kidding I pushed the button while you're talking <laughs> Are you kidding? Me? It's gone. It's, it's already frozen and shattered. All, All right, right, but Sam, so, what do you want to put in there? Well, I feel like I should have a smarter idea, but the, the first thing that came to my mind, and I want to say this to you about me. Stuart, any idea what I'm going to say? It's an enterprise, if that helps. What one little thing goes doesn't matter. So in season one, they fight a Klingon ship. But oh, it's, yes, okay, they just it load is. in the DS9, they, they go click click server, click click scenes, click click DS9, click click D7, load, render. And so they introduce a ship that they used six months earlier on DS9 inside Enterprise, even though they had another model on the hard drive ready that was made by one of their team for free because they wanted to. And it was, yeah. it was included because the windows they didn't think were big enough. Um, and while you don't necessarily think of it too much in the episode, they did tweak a little bit of the colours, but it's just annoying because it's just a mistake. It's just it's just a mistake. That's it. That's There's the nothing else to it. that's the D five or the D four that was, was D four, but it's just a D four model. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. No. Absolutely. I <laughs> I love seeing it in the show, but I hate seeing it in the show. Yep. So it's one, yeah, of, those, it's one uh, of those things where the mistake canon. Some things are just a mistake. It's like the deck kite in in Star Trek Five. It's it's not canon. It's a mistake. Like you can't. That's not canon. So that's why discovery stuff. You can kind of say, oh, "This is just a military. you know." It's like they call out the sect class as D seven. It's like it's not a D seven. It's a sect. And you undid it anyway. It's like yeah. you know, some things are just mistakes. And that was a mistake. Yep. No, I'm I'm good with that. Right. So those two things are sitting in the bay. First thing. Um, Paul, do you have anything you want to add to the bay? You know, uh, since we're just going crazy with the Cargo Bay 101 <laughs> today, I Heck will. Yeah, we are. I had a Trek Yards themed choice, uh, tr a Starships themed choice. Not, I'm not going to put either one of you in the airlock. Um, and you're all going to disagree with me, so I don't even know why Ooh. I'm bringing it up. Except uh, I, Starships with more than two nacelles, for some <laughs> reason, just I just hate them. I just they don't like the look. I think that it like throws off the like established like Starfleet aesthetic. And I, and Discovery was really bad about. You know that like how many four nacelled starships were in the battle of the binary stars like two, but still it was like, it was more than <laughs> I wanted to see. But yeah, yeah. hate them. <laughs> I, I disagree. I'm a big fan of the three nacelled dreadnoughts. I designed my how big a fan of you? You're referring to the um, the uh, galaxy class uh, no, the future no. enterprise. No, I, I don't oh. like the galaxy X at all, actually. But the going to Franz Joseph, like the the Federation class, I the, see. the old school style. Yeah. Okay. Three in a cell stewardship. Right. Yeah, right there, right behind him. That he's graphics. <laughs> fully class that I designed yeah. right there. Yes. Nice. You see, now I'm a big fan of the Constellation class. I do like the Stargazer a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do so you like I the Baran do... then? Um, I actually do like the Baran. Yeah, uh, it grew on me. I didn't like it the first time I saw it, but then actually when I saw the model. It mm -hmm. kind of more yeah. and more parts of it kind of caught my eye. Uh, didn't love seeing it in season three um, because why were all of the season one discovery ships? Anyway, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Um, okay, I myself would not put all uh, ships with uh, the uh, with more than two nacelles. So I don't know how we're feeling. What 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 are your feelings on it, guys? Obviously, I have a have a long history of of designing ships for fan films etc my own ship has three sets of nacelles and eight sets of warp coils so or well that's just excessive so I, oh, it's I, not though there's a reason if there's a reason <laughs> it doesn't look like there is it looks as if there's two which is a genius but in fact just to quote andrew probert who designed the constellation it hasn't got four nacelles it's got two pairs of two if that helps you think about that in any way so that's a slight technicality of 
Yeah. So when you get to three cells, core, core life by swapping out, so you can ex- get on. twice the usage out of a long range explorer because you don't and use there, more than a cell. And there really isn't anything beyond a, a four in a cell, except the Prometheus that has six, but two are inside the hull and not used until they're three sets of two. So really, it's just the fours and then a couple of threes. You know, threes and can be singles. fun. Well, and because oh. I'm no fun, I don't like the Prometheus class either. Well, so. I'm walking out. <laughs> That's Samuel's favorite. So, so okay, at the risk it's of fun. losing our guest this week, Paul, I think this is the one week where I think you've been outvoted. I think those multi multi nacelle ships are safe, uh, but the view screens and the Katinka class are going right out. <laughs> Now that they have been blown out into space, uh, that pretty much brings us up to time on this episode. Can we so shoot go, them? Well, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't worry. We just can't say that on the recording. Oh. However, I've got a few quantum torpedoes and a couple of bottles of uh, Romulan ale, and we're going to have us some fun. Uh, but I never said that. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining us this week. I Genuinely, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I mean, this almost seems silly to ask but where can people find you online guys on youtube look us up under trek yards all one word we're also on everything else discord facebook we have a very active facebook group which is a great place to find out about our videos and stuff as well um and instagram and yeah ev- everywhere we don't really post instagram and stuff but facebook and youtube is the is the big ones so check as you out. can tell we're based on the the ship content that's how we started and that's yes. still what we do every saturday and the trick is if you like any ship in trek just google trek yards that ship name very likely you'll find at least one video on it if not a designer interview with the person that worked on the show movie yeah. even from the jj and discovery etc all the all the above to talk about it it's all there excellent um, well, that's my weekend sorted. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, look, as I say, once more, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone who joined us this evening and who has listened to this on ACAR, Spotify, Amazon Music, all the all the usuals. Uh, I've been Sean. I'm Paul. And you've all been awesome. Have yourself a bloody good week. Live long and prosper. And once again, guys, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you.